Now, last year, we really made some big changes in the way that we handled the ASQ. And now all the screenings go through either birth to three or the school district. And um, we spent a year working through that. Um, we certainly had our bumps and some challenges, but we believe that we have worked out many of the issues that we had found last year. And we put together this provider manual so that we would be able to have our process work more smoothly. Um, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your time. So basically what we're going to do today is go through the manual just to give you some step-by-step -step guidance on how this will work. As Jenny had explained, if you have some questions, please feel free to put your hand, to um, note those questions in the question area where the widget is, okay? And we're going to go to the next screen, please. As you know, the goal is really to make sure that all children birth to five have access to developmental screening. The state of Delaware believes that this is very important for our children so that they get a good start. And the ASQ screening project is really a collaboration between so many different agencies. We've worked with the uh, Department of Education, the Office of Early Learning, and we have been collaborating with the Department of Health and Social Services, um, Delaware School Districts, Delaware Stars, the Head Starts, 211, and the readiness teams. As you can see, we've all been involved in this project. So what we want to do today is, as I said, we're going to just go through the manual and give you an opportunity to ask any questions that you may have. So first of all, we're going to start off with um, some of the responsibilities of the early learning uh, providers. The first thing that you need to do is to participate in that ASQ3 and SE2 training, and you can get that register for that training through DIEEC. Trainings are now occurring virtually. They are still going on. Um, you just need to check that website. Okay. If you have not yet registered your program, please contact Jenny in order to do something, in order to do that. Um, there is her email. Um, I want to let you know that there have been times that we've reviewed, we have received some screenings and um, the parents have noted the name of the child care that the child attends, but we don't have them listed because no one has ever contacted us to register. So if you are going to be using these, the portal from the Office of Early Learning and using this ASQ, please make sure to register with us so that you can get those results. You won't be, those results won't be available to you unless you contact us and we register you on our portal. Okay, um, the other thing I would like to say is that some of you may be registered because you were registered a while ago through Delaware Stars when we made that switch, but you may have never used the um, platform. So um, if you have not used the platform, you won't have a password. So therefore you're gonna need to contact Jenny um, and follow the directions from the previous um, slide so that you can get your welcome message resent. Um, what happens is after you fill out, after we get your information and we register you, you will receive a welcome message from do not reply brooks.com, okay? And they will ask you to then set up your password. Um, as the other thing you want to keep in mind is the fact that um, you're going to have two different sites that you're registering on. You will have the school district site and you'll also have the um, birth to three site. So therefore, it's actually two passwords that you'll be setting up. When you get that message from uh, do not reply Brooks, you have 24 hours in order to set up your password. 
if you don't do that within that 24 hours, it's going to tell you that your link has expired. So you will need to contact Jenny again in order to have her resend that message so that then we can um, make sure that we can send you that link again and you can get your password and you'll be up running. Okay. So one of the most important things that, I, that we would really like to see happen is for you to do some um, education about the importance of developmental screenings and milestones. And there are a lot of resources out there that are free of charge. Um, and we're gonna show you here, if you give us one minute. Okay, Delaware Thrives has a variety of different um, resources that are on there that you can order for free. And if, and if we could just pull up Delaware Thrives, Delaware Thrives the ones, mm -hmm, we're gonna show you what's there. Sure. Okay. Okay, the first thing you're gonna see this is the entire Delaware Thrives website. And what you'll see is there's all kinds of information here. Um, there's information for, um, looking up top here. There's information um, about how, uh, for men, about communities, about family shade. Um, they have the QT30 brochure there, which is a really cool brochure or booklet rather. And it provides a variety of activities for families to use with their children, um, dividing them based on age, which is really cool. Um, so it's really a fun thing for families to have. You can get those for free and give them to your families. But the thing that we're really concentrating on is that developmental screening portion there. When you come up to the developmental screening, it will give you all kinds of information about developmental screenings and why they're important. It'll explain what a developmental screening is and the developmental milestones will show, make sure that we can, we can track whether your child is growing um, according to the milestones. Um, they're really looking at how a child listens, talks, moves, behaves, and what they should be doing at certain ages, okay? We have that, the one that shows, right. So there are two really cool, that one, both, well, either one first. Okay. Okay. There are two really cool um, resources that I would recommend you looking into. The first one um, is the developmental screening brochure. And it's a brochure that explains everything about developmental screening. And as I said before, all you have to do is go into this website and you can order them and they are free of charge. They're really nice resources. Um, we worked with the Early Childhood Comprehensive Systems Grant in order to have some of, uh, they provide some of the funding for these Okay, and the next one that I wanted to point out This is um, the Developmental Milestone Pocket Guide. It kind of opens up like a map. It's really interesting. It's very small and compact, but you open it up and it'll actually have all of the developmental milestones so that it lets parents know what the expectations are for children of various ages. I know that, you know, first time parents and all, well, parents in general, often they don't really know what the expectations are. So it's been really helpful to a lot of families. Okay. Back to the slideshow. Um, back to the slideshow. Okay, we're going to go to the next page. Oh, and those are the um, links for you to get to those different project, um, those different resources. We are going to be sending you the slideshow presentation so that you will have that information. So after this is done, you will receive um, the PowerPoint. So you'll be able to order that stuff. Okay, so let's get down to it. When it comes to completing the screenings. Okay, so the first thing that you need to do is send out that invitation letter to the families to complete the ASQ. 
we really have changed things up. If you'll click on here. Um, what we have done is we've put together invitation letters um, for each of the different school districts. So that in the back of that manual that we've sent out, um, it is a, it was sent out through, uh, it was part of the REACH newsletter, it was sent out through OCCL, through their email blast, and um, it's also on the STARS website, excuse me, and it's on the OEL website. So you can find that manual anywhere in many locations. So in there, you're going to find actually a letter for each of the different school districts with their link that you can send out to families. Okay, so the one thing I want to let you know is that each of the school districts on their early learning website, we've asked them to please post that information um, in case there's any, any problem with that happening. Um, we wanted to make sure you had access to it as easily as possible. Okay, so you can find that in the appendix. One of the things that you need to be really careful about um, on that invitation letter, it asks you to list the name of your child care. So there's a lot of programs out there that have very, very, very similar names. It's really important if you want that, that child screening to end up in your classroom, you need to make sure that you are writing specifically what that child care is named. And for example, um, Kids Inc. that has several different locations, you wanna make sure that you're writing if it's um, Kids Inc. one, two, three, if it's Dell Tech or TLK, you want to make sure that you know where the location is so that we'll be able to actually know who is waiting for that screening to come through. So that's a really important piece. Next, please. Another thing, um, so the screenings are completed based on that child's age and where the child attends childcare. It isn't based on the district where the child lives, it's where that child is located, okay? So you're going to want to use the portal for where for the district where your child care is physically located. So um, for example, downstate, if the child is located in Seaford, you would use Seaford's invitation letter. Even if the family lives in Woodbridge, we have it arranged so that we can, if the child needs a referral, they'll be able to send that information to the appropriate school district so that they can follow up. But you must do the screening based on where that child care is. And I know for some of you, especially downstate, that's very different than how things were done previous to last year. Okay. Ah, so um, another thing. Please do not add the child profiles. Um, what we have found is when you add the profiles and we don't have a screening to go to, along with it, it's just another step for those people who are trying to process it. So they need to get the profile, they have to find out where the child is, put it in there, and then when the screening comes in, they need to get that, find it. So we would really like to make sure that that's all done at one time. Some of the school districts have very, very large caseloads and birth to three, they're actually handling the entire state. So that's a lot of people. So when the parents um, fill out the screenings, that's when the profile should be done. They will be doing it and it's less work for you. If you end up having to put that in, uh, if someone does it on paper, the screening on paper, and then you, need, you will need to add the child profile at that time. But it's, it would all be done at one time. Next, please. Okay, this is another one. We have learned the hard way. Many of these things we have learned the hard way, and that's why when we wanted to make sure to get the word out before people started their screenings this year. Only share the link that the family needs, okay? So children under 35 months, they get the birth to three link. If a family completes the ASQ for the incorrect link, what happens, it, it goes to birth to three. They put it in, they, it, when they review it, they then put it in my classroom, which is now Jenny's classroom. Then she needs to go on there and move it to the correct school district. That could slow things down possibly for a week or so, just because not everyone is working on these each day. Some people um, are looking at it maybe once or twice a week. So please make sure that you 
only send the information the family needs. Now, it is possible some of your families may have two children and they might have one that's under 35 months and one that's school district age. If that's the case, then send them both. But otherwise, please just white out the link that they that family will not need. Okay, so when you're completing the screenings, um, you want to make sure that you are monitoring the completion of the ASQ screenings um, and follow up when, to ensure that a parent completes them. So one thing I, another thing I need to note, it's really important, both the ASQ3 and the SE2 have to be done for the STAR, to meet the STARS verification. But the other thing you want to keep in mind is the fact that they, um, we want to get a look, a look at the whole child holistically. We want to know about their different levels on the ASQ3 and then know about their social and emotional development so that we can make some decisions and make some recommendations based on the whole child. The school districts, if they only get the ASQ3, um, birth to three also, they are not going to review that screening and give it back to you into your portal until both are completed because they need both. So please make sure that you do complete both of the screenings. Okay, um, if the family doesn't complete the ASQ screening, then um, you can request consent from the family to, for the teacher to complete that screening. If that's the case, the teacher must do must spend at least 20 hours a week with that child, okay? So um, another thing, the consent, you can find the consent form in the back of the manual also. We tried to put everything in there that you would need, so in case something happened and you couldn't get a hold of the district or the internet was down or whatever, um, that you would be able to at least get the forms and the papers that you need. So you can find that consent form in the in the in that packet, which is in the appendix in our um, manual. There also, the districts have also been instructed along with birth to three to put a consent form on their early learning page. So um, hopefully it will be there also. Okay, as I said, um, you do need to have that consent to screening sign. If, the, if you are completing it as a child care, you must have that signed by the parents. If the family is completing it, the consent form is embedded already into the platform, so you won't need to have a different platform, a different consent to sign, a consent signed by the family. You'll only need to have it done if your child care is doing it. Okay, go on. So we always hear about the fact that we have child carers that are just bypassing the families and doing the ASQ all by themselves. Um, we understand that there's going to be times that you may need to do it because the family is not cooperating. But I do want to let you know that re we really don't want it that way. This entire screening process has been standardized based on parents doing it. So the recommendation is that someone who spends at least 20 hours a week with that child complete the screening and only if the parent approves it and this should not be the standard expectation this should not be the way that your entire child care is getting things done okay parents are the ones who should be completing it and as i said um, if the if the center is completing it that should be the exception to the rule it should not be standard practice If the family completes the screening on paper, then what do we do? So the early learning provider is responsible for putting that information online. And what we're asking you to do is please use family access portal only. Um, that was another, another one that we learned by um, falling into that pitfall. We found that um, if you don't use family access, it goes just into the system, but it's really challenging to find that screening. So it creates a lot of problems if you don't use family access. So please, please, please use that family access portal only. 
Um, 211 is available to help with um, doing, putting the information online. And if you're interested, you can contact 211 um, and work with work a plan out with them. And the Office of Early Learning, we are also trying to work out with them um, a plan so that they will be prepared to make sure all this in case more people are going to access them for help. If you are manually en entering any children, okay, uh, please make sure that you're sending the list of children to um, birth to three and the school district. As I said, we wanna make sure that they will know which children that they should be expecting to come through. Also remember, um, you must add those screenings through the family access portal. It really did create a lot of problems. And when a family um, will submit a screening, it's gonna go directly to either birth to three or to the school district for review. At that time, birth to three or the school district is going to be responsible for providing those screening results to the family and making the appropriate referrals, okay? Your program is gonna be listed within the portals for both birth to three in the school district. And what's gonna happen is they're going to put, it, put them into your provider classroom so that then you will have access, okay? And there is a cheat sheet that's attached at, actually that helps you, um, gives you some directions to help you find your results and set up different alerts. Please be proactive. Um, notify birth to three or the school district if you're coming out with STARS re-verification. It would be nice to give them one month notice so that um, they can make sure that they're on top of things and know that you are looking for your screenings. Um, check to make sure all the children are in your program, um, that they have their ASQs and work with your school district in birth to three to assure that you can meet that stand standard. Um, unfortunately, in the past, I've had some, some programs that have actually contacted me when they were in the middle of re-verifying. So um, it really is much easier and a better process if we make sure that we are ready for that before the day of, of the re-verification. Okay, some things that we also learned this year. Um, what we are going, what we have instructed the school districts and birth to three to do is that when the, that the screenings are going to be archived um, once the birth to three, once they hit, um, once they hit three, they'll be arch archived. And for the children that are in the three to five year old um, age group, once they hit kindergarten age, those will also be archived. Um, we've asked birth to three in the school districts to please make sure to check their information at least every two weeks. Some of them are doing it much more often than that. Some of them are, depending on the school district, um, different school districts have different resources that they've put in place to help with this process. So please be patient and remember sometimes during high volume screening times, like at the beginning of the year, um, it might take a little bit more time because they may be overloaded with a lot of screenings at one time. So please be patient. And if you are coming up for re-verification for STARS, let the district know so that they will be looking for those screenings as a priority. And birth to three. Once again, I can't say it enough, make sure that um, you are entering the information online through that family access portal. Okay. So, Last year we had um, one thing that we found out is that um, how we're going to be monitoring and making sure that follow-up is found out by the providers. So initially um, we're going to be putting that information online, okay? So it will be noted in those follow-ups as far as what information, um, if the child is being referred for an evaluation, if the child is being um, needs to be referred for to the physician and all that information. That, and we will be speaking with the families about that. However, um, we thought that people would be able to write into in the notes area so to keep you updated as to what was going to happen um, next with that referral or whether they couldn't get a hold of parents or whatever. 
Um, unfortunately, we really can't do that. First of all, we would need a release of information in order to do that. And second of all, um, once the school districts or birth to three actually got started on the referral for special education, they really aren't going back to the screening in order to keep track of things. They have a lot of um, regulations that they need to be involved in in order to keep that referral going and make sure they're documenting everything in specific places. So to ask them to go back to the notes area of the screening, um, they felt that was just too much for them at this time. So what we did was to put a release of information for and we developed that for you. It is also in that appendix so that if you want to, if you have a question, you can ask the parent to please sign off on that. And then you can ask the, you can contact either birth to three or, or the school district and ask them whatever questions it is that you have about that child. They won't be able to answer questions unless they have that release of information. Okay, so the, what birth to three and the school districts, they are to be reaching out to you about screening and resources. I know there is a wide variety depending on which district you live in. Some districts are doing an amazing job, really working with communities, having meetings, doing all kinds of things in order to reach out to the child cares. And others who don't have as many resources are not doing quite as much, okay? They are to make sure to share that consent to screen and any other form that's needed for that early child provider, needed for you um, on the website. And also we're asking them to make sure that they're looking at those screenings at least two weeks, at once every two weeks and indicate in the notes what the initial recommendations will be. We also want to make sure that they're working with early learning providers to assure that all the screenings are in the list for that STARS re-verification and sharing the results um, of the screening and follow-up activities with families who do complete that online. They're also responsible for making the referrals to whichever, whoever that's going to and meaning, maintaining records regarding referrals and eligibility. That was one of the things that um, one of the big reasons for this big switch is the fact that there were so many screenings through so many different programs going on and there was no way to track it. There was no way to know what actually happened with those referrals um, and those uh, what or not children were actually um, deemed eligible for services or what was going on. Um, so they are, con they are now maintaining those records so that we can keep track of who is eligible, who isn't, and try to determine just how, um, how effective this screening tool is. And as I said, they will also be archiving the screenings uh, for the children that are entering kindergarten. Okay, I'm gonna pass it on to Jenny's. Okay, we're having an intermission now, I hear. So give us one minute so that, um, and then we're gonna talk about, show you exactly how to do everything online. Give us one minute. Alrighty, so now we're getting into how do I get my results? All right, so let's see if I can do this for you too. So I'm gonna take you over. Um, alrighty, so here we are on the ASQ platform. So first things first, we're gonna talk through how do I get my results? So of course you're gonna go ahead and log in. I'm already logged in here as you can see. And then we're gonna click on ch uh, child profiles, right? So this child profile screen is gonna give you everybody here. And then we are going to um, scroll down. Sorry, I'm having some mouse issues here. We're gonna go ahead and scroll down and I'm gonna just go ahead and click on the child that I would like to get my results for. And then if I scroll down, oops, scroll down here, you'll see the child screenings area. If you click view all, what that's gonna do, and now it's not going to do it for this child because there's only two screenings in for this child, but typically if you have um, more going on, you know, more questionnaires that, that have been completed, you would be able to get here and then you can go ahead and click the ones that you want. You can print, you can print your summaries, right? And um, you can also print multiple summaries from one child. Now you can't print multiple summaries from multiple children, but you can do multiple um, summaries from the same child. So then and, and that summary page is what you need for your STARS verification or re-verification. Um, 
so let's see here. So printing a child, you're going to, um, like I said, you're gonna click the one and then you're going to hit print summaries and then you queue your job. So once you click queue job, and I'm gonna take this almost all the way through, um, it'll go ahead and run. And then you can either choose a zip or a PDF. Um, I typically like to do a PDF. That's just a personal preference. So once I download my PDF, I see it down here and then I can go ahead and pull it up. And then you can go ahead and print from that screen. Okay. And just so you know, this child that I'm showing you as a mock child is mine and I give permission to be sharing this information virtually. <laughs> Alrighty, so let me then um, go back here. So I'm going to click out of that and I'm actually just going to go back to ASQ, okay, just so we can get back to the beginning here. So I'm going to go back to home. Alrighty. Um, and then the next thing that I'd like to review with you guys is how to set up your alerts. And now Family Access um, does allow us to be very flexible with our day and time and frequency of you receiving an alert. And you can set that up um, for screenings that have been accepted and to assigned to you as a provider. Alrighty. So what we're going to do is you're going to go into um, My Profile. And then you're going to go over here to My Alerts. And then here, that's where you can see, they have all these fun alerts that you can set. So you can set yourself task reminders, screening alerts. What you're going to want to set up is your family access alerts, which are right down in this area. And here's where you can choose. You have the option between texting or emailing. You can also change um, how you would like to do that if you want that weekly, daily, um, you know, what, what is best for you. And um, you can also set the time and day that that comes in. So for me, I have my stuff set up 9 a.m. on Wednesdays. Um, let's see here. And I do have my little outline to kind of keep me on track. So I do apologize for looking down every so often. Um, but, you know, these alerts are are really great for you to just be on top of the screenings that are coming in for you guys to know who's coming in. Um, and then of course, just a little asterisk note is that uh, you you may be charged for your text based on your you know phone, whatever program you have or whatever um, setup you have as far as texting. Alrighty, so then, we good? Okay. Uh, so the other thing that we're going to want to do is just check to make sure that your email is correct because, of course, it's going to automatically send to whatever information you have in your profile. So, you know, if you if you realize that you're not receiving this information or you're wondering, you know, hey, I set this up, but I'm not receiving it, just go back into your profile and double check to make sure that your email is correct as well as your um, phone number, you know, if you have that in there. And then that should hopefully clear that up. We talked about printing child summaries. Okay. And then of course, um, you will be receiving this PowerPoint, but this information is also in your manual as well. So if you find that I've gone through it a little bit too quickly, or you're not quite sure, you do have this in both of those places, the manual and when we send this out. And then of course, you can always contact me and I'm more than happy to help you walk you through, do a little Zoom where I can share screen, whatever you need to support you guys. Alrighty, so some things to think about when you're setting up alerts that you can pick the time, day, and frequency that you would like to receive the alert. Um, and like I said, you can choose text, email, both, however you would like it. Um, they're not going to alert you each time a screening has been submitted, but it's going to submit, you know, within your time frame. So if you set it on Wednesday and then somebody goes into your classroom on Thursday, it's not going to email you on Thursday. It's going to wait and email you the next Wednesday when your alert is set up to drop. All right, so these are just more step-by-step um, -step guide on how to set up your alerts. Okay. And then of course, here's a little bit more about how to set up your text and email alerts. Alrighty, and some things to think about is, so if you choose to receive these messages daily, in the time column, select the time that you want to receive those alerts from the drop-down menu. But if you want to receive them 
um, weekly instead. In the time column, select the day of the week that you want to receive the message um, from the day drop down menu. And then you can select the time of day that you would like to receive the message from the time drop down menu. All right, we want to make sure that these are set to on, and then we also want to make sure that we save our changes. You also don't have to receive these alerts at the same time. If you want to stagger them, you can sign them up at different times. So if you want once a month via email, once a month via text message, or I'm sorry, once a week via email, once a week via text message, you can um, set that up that way as well. But just make sure that your mobile phone number, your cell phone should be in your pro uh, profile if you would like to receive texts. If your number is not there or if it's a landline, you will not receive the text messages. All right, so some things to keep in mind. Let me just get a little caught up here. Um, so some things to keep in mind. If you have a child that's attending two programs, you don't need to screen the child twice. And actually we prefer you do not uh, screen the child twice. Instead, what you're gonna do, you're gonna request a summary sheet from the other program so that you have um, your evidence, your proof for STARS. However, if a child has completed the screen, within one month and then transfers into your program, you can also have the family sign a release form and then they're going to request that information to be transferred from um, to your program rather than rescreening the child. Because of course we don't want to be rescreening a child if they just had a screening and we also want to you know work together to collaborate to get that information. Um, and then the last thing is to contact me, Jenny, by the way, hi, I'm Jenny, to, uh, to transfer a screening. So if anything does come up, you can always shoot me an email and let me know that um, you'd like me to transfer a screening for you and I can help out with that. Um, some other thoughts too are that there is an RO. OI, so a release of information that's in the back of the manual, feel free to rev revise this release of information. And this request is, is to receive and give information between child cares. Um, so, you know, you can either use that or some of you might already be doing this and it is completely acceptable. You can have the family write a letter that gives permission um, to share that screening information with the new child care placement. All right, so um, obviously you can't just call up another child care and ask for that information. However, if you have a release of information or if you have a letter from the family stating that you're, they're giving permission for this um, information to be shared, then they can go ahead and share that information. Um, the last thing, and it's not on the slide, but I also wanna share with you guys is make sure that when, um, when ASQs are being submitted, that families are completing both. So what we don't want is we don't want the ASQ3 going in for review and then later on the ASQ2, um, SE2 going in for review. We want them going in at the same time. And if they are separate, um, if they're separate, then, then that screening is not going to be reviewed because all of the information is not there. So we want to really make sure that both of those, uh, both of those screenings for those families and those children go in at the same time into family access. All right. So the next thing to keep in mind, um, families that have children that are birth to 35 months, you guys should be using the birth to three link only. So if a uh, child is screened and they're using the incorrect link, that's going to need to be transferred to the correct portal. So as Jamie had mentioned before, um, you know, when, when these glitches happen, which they do come up and I have no problem smoothing them out. However, we want to try to get into practice to be using the process the way it's intended because that's really going to smoothen things out and make, make the results quicker. So we don't want to do anything that's going to be delaying our results. Um, so if you guys can just make sure that you are sharing the correct link, um, as well as, you know, that the families are using the correct link, then hopefully that can cut down on some of those delays for receiving the results. Um, and we did want to note this because in, in the past, that's been a problem. And as we start moving in, I guess, if you know, with the beginning of the school year, I've already started to notice some kids in my transfers that need to go into a different program. So please make sure that you're just sending the correct link. That would be really helpful. All right. And then the other thing that I'm pretty sure that Jamie touched on earlier is that um, 
remind families to put the specific name of the, of the preschool that their child attends. So there's many programs with very similar names. I'm talking a little fast and the captions aren't keeping up with me, so I got to slow it down a little. <laughs> so like I was saying, keep in mind that there's many different child cares out there and different programs that have very similar names. Or there might be, you know, Kids Place 1 and Kids Place 2. Um, it's very important for your families to note on the ASQ form the specific name, the full specific name that their child um, of the child care that their child attends. So that that way we know where to where to send that information once it comes through the portal. Um, and again, this is something that if we have families doing it and being proactive, it'll help smoothen the process and you guys will get your results a lot quicker. And one thing to keep in mind, um, you're not going to receive the information unless we know that the child attends your program. So thinking about that, you might have John Smith's family complete one. If they don't say where your child, where their child is attending, we don't know that that child is attending that child care. So you have the, you know, the one issue of being clear of where it is, but then also, you know, we want to make sure that we are able to put the children in their correct places once they're on family access. All right. My mouse disappeared. Here. All right, so we're going to go ahead and take a little pause here. Um, I think we might have some questions coming in in the chat bar, so I want to go ahead and choose and uh, check on that. So thank you so much. So um, I did check some of the questions in the chat room um, and have been answering them online. Um, one question was, where do you find the um, the log on information, the link in the invitation letters? Um, we have basically an introduction about the ASQ, and then if you look down further, it has both the birth to three. And so it's kind of towards the middle to the bottom of the page, and it has birth to three along with the school district. Um, if you don't know what school district you're in, um, you can actually go online and uh, go to the DOE website. Um, and there is a place you can type the address into, um, into the information, I don't remember. I, I will I will find out the exact place you can do it. So that we will put that information in there. So you make sure that you are giving everyone the correct um, school district information. Another question was if you've already put the profiles in, whether or not you should erase them. Um, I think that at this point, if it's not a problem, I would take them out so that people don't have to then move them um, and have to um, work on those same children more than once, okay? So um, those were two that I picked out. All of the questions that we're receiving, we're going to be answering, and what we will be doing is to put that into an email that will come out along with the slide presentation so that you should have all of your answers along with the slide presentation. You'll have Jenny's contact information, and we should be ready to roll. So to wrap this up, okay. Um, some of the things we're really hoping to get out of this entire um, change is a reduce, uh, reducing the duplication of services and ensuring that specialists view the, review the screenings. So as Jenny explained, um, there were times where children were in one one school district, excuse me, one child care. They might move to another child care and each time they go somewhere, they have to have another screening completed. So hopefully um, now that we can transfer some of the screenings from one to another child care, um, that will be helpful. Also, People attend two different programs. For example, you might have a child that goes to the school district for part of the day as a typically developing peer, and then the rest of the day they're going to a child care, and both of those programs may have been doing a screening. There's no reason for a child to be screened in both locations. So we're really trying to decrease duplication of services. The other thing is we really wanna make sure that some specialists do review the screenings, uh, early childhood, 
uh, the, it's actually the educational diagnosticians or uh, child find coordinators who are reviewing those screenings and making the recommendations. Uh, the state is really looking at, could you go back please? The state is really looking at um, the data that we're getting. We're trying to determine what kind of trends there are, um, what areas we need to concentrate on, how to allocate those resources. I know um, the Books, Ball and Blocks, Books, Balls and Blocks program, um, they have been looking at the information um, through our Early Childhood Comprehensive Systems Grant. And um, when they're doing their different activities, they're doing that based on the screenings in specific areas. If children need extra help in fine motor skill and they're doing that, uh, doing a books, ball and blocks um, program in that area where they need fine motor skill help, they'll concentrate on that. So we're really looking at trying to get resources out in specific areas. The other thing is, it is so important that every child gets screened and we really wanna reach more children, assess their development earlier, because the earlier that we can find them, um, the less that gap will grow. So that we'll have, we'll be able to catch them up and they have a greater chance to reach their maximum potential. So the state in general really strongly believes in screening all of our children. And we're hoping that all of you can help us to meet that goal. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for your patience. 